thank you for joining us for our fourth Lusk Perspective series. Uh, I'm Richard Green. I'm director of the USC Lusk Center for Real Estate, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. So with that, let me introduce our terrific panel today to talk about these issues of property management, tenant management, lease management, et cetera, in these times. I have said to them, they don't have to share bad news if they don't have any, but if they do, please, how are you being informed by it and how are you dealing with it? Um, our panelists are uh, Stanley Eisman, who is the CEO of American Realty Advisors, has been a member of our board for some years now. I think, Stanley, you go well before, back well before my time, don't you? Yes, that's yeah. true. And, uh, and he teaches uh, in the Emirate program, the Dollinger Emirate program for us. Uh, Rachel Wine, who is a retail consultant, one of her leading clients is Publix, which as I'm sure you know is one of the most successful uh, grocery chains <clears throat> in the country. Uh, she is a co-member with me of the CRC Gold uh, Product Council at ULI. That's how I've gotten to know her and very thoughtful about what are the influences affecting the retail market in general and right now in particular. Um, and finally, uh, David Dollinger, for whom our Masters of Real Estate Development program is named, the Dollinger MRED. Um, David also is a member of, I believe, the inaugural class of the MRED degree and uh, a very successful developer and owner of industrial property. And so uh, we have coverage of pretty much all property types here and we're eager to hear what you have to say. So I think what I'll do is I'll just start looking at my right and go to my left, which you have no idea what that means, but it's gonna be Stanley, then Rachel, then David. So Stanley, if you could say a few words about what you're seeing out there right now. Okay, well, since it's only been a month since we went into lockdown mode with shelter in place rules, I think that a lot has changed over the last uh, several weeks. Um, three weeks ago, I was concerned about the retail impact of our, of our retail tenants with all the letters that we were receiving from our tenants um, concerning force majeure and impossibility of performance and seeking rent reductions. And then we thought that that was going to translate into um, our, the rest of our portfolio as well. And what we're very pleased to, to announce is, is that actually we were very surprised in terms of our collections. Um, on the office side, we're about 82%. In our multifamily, we're about uh, 92%, I'm sorry. In our multifamily, we're about 91%. Um, our industrial, we're about 90%. And in our retail portfolio, we're about uh, 55%. So what we expected clearly came about as, as a result of our, of our retail. So what have we been doing right now over the last uh, several weeks as we've been trying to develop protocols to deal with each one of our tenants in our various portfolios um, and how we're going to respond to each one of them um, is really start to look at each of the leases and determine whether there are clauses in each of those leases that we can negotiate out as part and parcel of any rent reduction um, that we're going to be dealing with. And that's going to be an open open item to see whether we're going to be successful at that, number one. And number two, to really acknowledge the fact that there may be a uh, PR risk of doing that. Because the fir at first and foremost, we do have to recognize that on the retail side, and I'll let Rachel really deal with this, is that we want our retail um, tenants and our small mom and pops to survive, and we recognize that they're being decimated as a result of what is transpiring. The shocker to me, though, is the number of tenants that have sent in rent relief requests um, from on the retail side and on the office side um, that are major tenants with well capitalized and have the ability to pay the rent. And I find it shocking that they're asking for rent relief, major law firms around the country asking for rent relief. Um, when we know that they have had successful years over the last several years. So we sort of put, put that in the bucket of moral hazard. We are looking at this in differently. Um, than, uh, than we would otherwise. And it reminds me of a, of a great expression that I remember somebody in our school once said, Richard, which was, um, you're a capitalist when things are going well, then you're a socialist when things are going bad. Um, and it seems like everybody's becoming a socialist right now, looking for somebody to hand a, give them a handout um, in terms of being able to operate. Um, I won't get into PPP right now, which is the payroll protection plan and the loans that are gonna be 
um, we're going to be talking about, but it's something that probably should be discussed um, in this in this um, call. One question before I turn it over to Rachel, which is um, when you're talking about collections, that's as of what date and how do they look compared to an usual month as of that date? Um, I think uh, we're looking at it as of yesterday um, in terms of collections. So it's real time information and it's only off. Um, it's off by about 8% in terms of what we typically get. Okay. Except right. the retail. I mean, I'm sorry, the retail yeah. is off. No, I understood, yes. but I was curious about the office and apartment. Right. Was that? Um, that's tenants, that's not dollars, so we're not dollar weighting this at all. Got it, okay, great. Thank you, Stanley. Uh, Rachel. All right, uh, so Stanley touched a bit on, on retail. I'll go uh, a bit deeper on that, and I just wanna set the groundwork. So Richard, first of all, thank you for having me. This is my first experience with uh, the Lusk Center, so I'm really uh, pleased to be here with you all uh, from sunny South Florida, um, and I work with both tenants and landlords, so institutional grade owners and then operators and Publix and Kroger would be two major grocery retailers that I work with. So I just wanna caveat that these are my opinions and not those of Publix or Kroger. Um, but I would say that generally in retail, what, what Stanley has, has said is, is uh, reflected um, nationally. If we could break that down a bit on the mall side, uh, we're seeing collections uh, roughly 15 to 20% um, of expected at this point in the month. Uh, if, if it's a lifestyle center, uh, maybe up to 20 to 25% of April rents collected in the uh, shopping center space, grocery anchored, institutional quality, roughly 50%. If it's, it's a little bit better in uh, the grocery dominated sector, in which case it's 50% collected roughly of the uh, adjacent small shop spaces. And I do think it's important to caveat that um, we're talking about the institutional quality space. So for most of these large national retailers, um, it, it, I still find this shocking that 80, 70 to 80% of their landlords are single owners, uh, mom and pop owners of shopping centers. Um, and you know, let's call it 60 some odd thousand shopping centers in the country of which uh, only call the top 10% are owned by REITs and maybe you know, double or triple that and you end up with all of the institutional grade um, retail shopping centers in the country. So um, this information is skewed towards the better quality assets and we're still seeing um, you know, rents recoveries pretty terrible. Um, if we could put some lipstick on it, I guess uh, there are, certain bright spots and then other um, concerning areas. Um, and uh, I I'm gonna go ahead and name names. Uh, this is public, uh, Staples is open and operating and not paying rent. Ross sent a letter out to all of their uh, landlords that they were not gonna pay rent for all of 2020. They then advanced April rent to their owners. Um, and I think this may be some of the tenants that Stan is alluding to that um, in good times, it's good, and in bad times, um, you know, those good times have evaporated, I suppose, for those retailers. So I think we've been telling a narrative over the last 12 to 18 months that landlords and retailers are on the same side against Amazon, and that's been, you know, the narrative that we've been talking about. And, you know, now I think it's really clear which retailers are, you um, willing to partner with their landlords for the best outcome, acknowledging that everyone is having pain and which ones are only um, thinking of themselves in short term. Um, you know, generally when we're thinking about rent relief and, and what we're expecting, we're bucketing tenants into, are they open and operating? Are they essential retail? Are they open, but you know, at some significantly reduced rate, which would be some uh, restaurants where they may be getting double the um, takeout revenue. So if takeout is five to 10% of a typical uh, restaurant, um, they might be getting double that, but of course that's still 70 to 80% less than normal sales. So what kind of relief are we giving to them? Uh, and then all the other mom and pops. So, and I would, I would lump uh, single franchisees in with the mom and pops and we're being as generous as we possibly can. Um, significant uh, deferrals and the only abatements that I've seen um, across the board are with Publix supermarkets. Publix owns 282 shopping centers, uh, over 2,500 uh, single tenants, and uh, they have fully abated rent for two months. So I'll leave it there, that's a bright side. 
So let me, let me, one follow up question, Rachel, is when you look at that lack of collections, and, and this will also riff off of Stanley's point, what share of it do you think are, is the moral hazard issue? And what share do you think is people just don't have any money to pay the rent? You know, I, I, I can't put a number on that. It is unknowable. It is unknowable. Certainly a large portion of them can pay, but for mom and pop tenants, I just, I don't know that they can pay. And if they could pay April, I'm very concerned about their ability to pay May. So I, I'm not, as bad as it sounds for April, I'm much more concerned about May. Um, and I, I don't think anyone that could tell you differently is, no one can tell you differently. I, you know, I just want to let, tag on to what Rachel was just talking about. I mean, there has been a continuing trend of, of retail stores um, shutting down over the last three years. So all this has done is exacerbate and accelerate the pace at which uh, the, the slowdown has occurred. There were a lot of companies out there that were completely over leveraged and had balance sheets that were just not supported, supportable of their business model. And all this has done is just push those over the edge and those that are being backed by, and this is really where a challenge comes in. Those retailers that are backed by private equity firms, think about that. I mean, why should, why shouldn't they pay up? They've got the portfolio capital behind it to be able to fund the operations and to pay rent. Um, just a, a dimension that I just want us all to think about as we're thinking, talking about this. Yeah, I, I think that's important. I mean, there, there is certainly going to be a share of these larger national retailers that, um, well, that do not open again, period. Um, and that will be largely an ex acceleration of what we expected. So I think there's really, there's two camps here and, and we're going to talk about where we see the future. Um, there are the folks that will not open up again. Surely there, there are. There is also a large chunk and I don't think the retailers have quite had their moment yet um, where they really come to realize that this is necessary. But if you have 150, sorry, 1500 stores, or 750 stores, and you have limited capital, you should really strongly consider not opening back up all 1500 stores or all 750 stores. So we have not seen that conversation had within the retailers executive teams. There's still a focus on, you know, well, anyhow, it'll happen. <laughs> so uh, David, before I turn it over to you, just because we have a number of people uh, come into the room, let me just repeat the ground rules. Uh, to avoid being Zoom bombed, we have turned your mics off and the chat function off. So if you have a question for any of our panelists, please send an email to luskctr, all one word, L-U-S-K-C-T-R at U-S-C dot E-D-U. So David, please tell us uh, how you're viewing industrial right now. Well, my portfolio is mainly uh, R&D in Silicon Valley and uh, also some buildings in San Diego. And... Um, I think it's pretty good. I think I'm not going to put a number on it, but it's, it's above 90% paid. Um, there was a few venture capital backed firms that uh, played games and said they couldn't pay rent. And then we gave, gave them notices and uh, they all paid. Um, but it's, we also own a bunch of retail as well in Los Angeles and in Northern California. And uh, there were probably in the 55 to 60%. Um, the grocery stores, the pharmacies, the banks, the urgent cares, they've all paid. Um, every restaurant in our portfolio, except for, and I'll call it fast food, uh, Starbucks and Chipotle did not pay this month. And uh, what is amazing to me, and Stanley said this before, is the amount of so-called credit companies that couldn't pay their rent within two weeks. And it's just, it's astonishing to me. And uh, I got the same letter from Ross and Ross has always been a very difficult tenant. And uh, if they don't want to pay May in my center, we're going to evict them and uh, we'll replace them with someone else. And so um, we have sent eviction notices to, if you're a credit company and you've got stores across the country and you didn't pay this month, like Bed Bath & Beyond, then you got an eviction notice. If you're a mom and pop, we gave you two months of no rent and then you can pay it back over the next year. Um, and if you're a chain in between, we've worked out various deals. Um, but I don't really have any sympathy for the credit companies that uh, don't want to pay their rent. You know, one of the contrasts to me is when I've seen rent collections on apartments, I mean, this is nationally while they're down. If you look at how much they're down, it almost perfectly tracks new unemployment claims. 
So you can map almost one-to-one -one people who are not paying their apartment rent with people who just don't have any money right now. So that's what I, that's not a moral hazard thing. That's a people don't have any money to pay thing. And it, and it sounds like in uh, the non-apartment space, things are quite different. And so, and, and that's sort of what happened if we go back to the financial crisis, we saw very different, we saw very similar sorts of behavior on the consumer side vis-a-vis -vis the business side with respect to um, with respect to credit. Let me, let me um, throw something in, Richard, yeah. about that. Because first of all, I mean, I thought what we thought was going to happen was in our, in our portfolio is that there would be a differentiation between the A, B, and C quality properties. And we thought that the C properties would underperform just simply because that was workforce housing. And surprisingly, that has not actually happened. But wow. that's the month of, that is the month, it's, it's, it's down. I mean, it's significantly, it's about, it, it's significantly down be, um, from the A quality. Um, but it was nowhere near what we would have expected because those are the first people to be laid off. Um, we think that that is just um, aberrational because of the fact that it's in April. Um, where our big risk is, is what's going to happen in May, as Rachel was talking about. That's our, our big concern is May is the big month for, for all of us. But the, what I will say is, is there opportun everybody's being opportunistic with regard to paying rent. Even the, yeah. the A tenants who, are, who, are, um, who have great jobs, they're being opportunistic, saying, "Give me, have sympathy, um, give me to give me opportunities to pay over time," and we're just saying, "No, we're just not going to do it because we just just don't think it's appropriate to do um, in the in that space." In the industrial side, I will say though, there's a, there's an interesting observation is that in our multi-tenant um, industrial portfolio, there has been a, a fall off. So it's about a, as I said, it's about an eight to ten percent fall off in rent. Um, but it's typically coming from the multi-tenant, smaller uh, tenants that are servicing the, re the retail sector that are not able to perform because they can't get out there. So supply chain really becomes an issue um, for, for everybody involved in this conversation. So let me follow up on a comment Dave made when he talked about who he was giving rent relief to mm -hmm. and the length of time he was giving. So, so it's forbearance of rent. It's not uh, elimination of rent for two months. And you're saying you will give those tenants 12 months afterwards to pay the rent back. And, and the question I have is, is that going to be burdensome or do you think that makes sense? And what else are people seeing, thinking about with respect to how does the catch up happen when we come out from this? And I'll, I'll leave that for any of our three panels. Well, I'll just say this. The most important thing is to have tenants in your buildings and tenants that are paying rent. So evicting all of your tenants doesn't do you any good. So we want them to survive. So I think you need to take it on a, um, a each individual tenant and see their own situation. Um, it's not a one catch all for everybody. So we're going to have tenants that we probably aren't going to collect rent. We're going to forgive it. But generally, we're going to tenants saying, okay, you want these two months free, then extend your lease for five years or get rid of this exclusive clause or do something else. And so there's a little bit of give and take in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't just come and say, give me, what, what shocks me is the amount of credit tenants that write you a letter and don't ask for rent deferment or relief. They just tell you, we're not paying in the next three months. Yeah. You know, tough, tough. You, you, we're just not paying. And it's just, to me, in the 2001 downturn, which focused on the high tech here, the retail kind of saved me. And I got all the VCs wanting all this free rent. This is the exact opposite. Now we have the industrial and R&D doing well, and the retail is acting like the VC firms did in 2001 and just not paying. So it's, it's a complete opposite, which is, I think, rather interesting. I think they're also forgetting that, you know, as a credit tenant, in many cases, they have below market rent, significantly below market rent. And that's an investment that the owner has in that tenant because they believe that, you know, when it's a rainy day, they're going to pay their rent. So if they're not paying rent and it's, four, five, six, eight bucks a foot, I mean, depending on where it is, for some of these off-price retailers, they should get a default letter. One, one of the things I would like to point out, though, this, this is just sort of an operational issue with the, um, the issue of giving these rent deferrals and trying to amortize it back in. And you've asked a very good question, Richard, Richard as to whether the tenants are going to be able to start paying that, that bonus rent that they're going to have to bulk up on their, um, on their rent schedule. Um, that's a big concern. So what David was talking about extending the term um, is now becoming more of a default position because you don't want to burden the tenants too much. 
with, uh, with paying more rent when you're coming out of this, um, this problem in a slow manner. But I would suggest, though, that for everybody who's listening who's got a, uh, an accounting department, and depending upon how large your, your firm is, you ha- there has to be interaction between the accounting department to make sure everybody really understands what these deferrals are going to do to your rent schedules um, and making sure that your, your, um, your accounting books are, are maintained appropriately. And if you're a public company, those straight line rents have a, don't, do not have the same effect as a private company like us where we're going to be marking to market and adjusting on a regular basis. So the rents have to be balanced off and understood within everybody who's in the chain of reporting to our investors. So it's something that everybody needs to think about. So uh, Rachel, what are you in, in terms of what people are doing at the end of the rent abatement period or the forbearance period? What are you seeing out there? So we're seeing, um, 12 month payback as, as has already been mentioned. Um, but you know, the reality is we're making these decisions now. I just, it, it's all going to depend on when we all get back to business. Right. So I, I think a lot of this is just kicking the can down the road. So it's easy to say we're going to defer your rent for two months and then you'll pay it back over 12 or you'll pay it back at the end. Um, you know, it, it matters if it's, three or four or five months of very depressed sales, um, we're all going to have to go back and look at this. But I'd rather look at it in July and look back and say, how did we really do in May and June and make accommodations for that rather than looking in my crystal ball and imagining what the next two months are going to look like. So, you know, for the, I think it's a very easy decision for both the uh, landlord and the tenant to say, let's, let's agree on a deferral. We can agree, you know, we think it's going to be a 12 month payback or, or whatever it is. And we'll look at it again. You know, I mean, this, this is where the partnership comes in and, and something to Stan's point on public companies. One of the things that I'm concerned about or just interested to see what will happen is how they're going to reserve for these non-payments. Mm-hmm. So are they going to call it AR? Are they going to write off some of it? Because we're going to start to see, I mean, first of all, any company that already has, AR that's concerning, you know, we are just going to be piling that on and it's going to be very visible very soon. So you're, you're just, you're making me miss our late great chair of the Lust Center, Stan Ross, who was a brilliant real estate accountant because he would tell us exactly how to think about the accounting for this stuff. And he'd almost certainly be right. Um, we, we do have a question from Paul Buss for Rachel, which is, again, I, I think I know how you're going to answer it, but I'm going to ask it anyway, is when do you see reopening of shopping centers beginning? So I, I think um, we can look a little bit to Asia for some idea of what this might look like. And I'll try to break it down into different use cases. Um, you know, I, I'm, a little bit of Asia, a little bit of what we saw, believe it or not, 100 years ago in 1918, and a, a little bit of what I hear from my husband on the medical side. Um, you know, I think we're going to start to be let out of our houses in a staged effort, probably, I'm going to say first of June. Um, what's happening in Asia right now is even as people are able to leave their homes, they're still being, there's still a recommendation that you should generally stay close to home. They've had maybe 500 cinemas open up in um, China so far. They've been virtually empty. I mean, I think we're going to see either forced um, reduction in capacity at restaurants and theaters and, you know, churches and casinos. Like, we're going to see forced reductions there. Um, and that could go on for a long time. Then we're going to have to see if we end up with something like in Singapore where they go back to work there's an outbreak, they go back home. So until we're doing, um, and this is my husband's estimation, until we're doing a million tests a day, we're going to have a hard time figuring out how this is spreading and what localized areas we can start to do contract tracing and other kinds of smaller scale shutdowns. Um, I would expect to see uh, semi-permanent reductions in capacity at restaurants uh, for internal seating, spacing six feet apart, maximum four people per table. Um, That could be 30 or 50% of typical capacity. That's if people leave their homes to go and eat. Um, And then, you know, certainly rent is a function of sales. So we're going to have to adjust there. So when we had uh, Clay Doobie a couple of weeks ago talk about China, he had a very striking picture of 
restaurants in Wuhan that had police tape around every other table in order to maintain that six foot. Yeah, so let me add to that also. Um, I think we're going to see uh, temperature checks. Um, there are now pretty easy cameras that people can put yep. in. Yeah, every day my wife walks into the hospital, they, they do her temperature with an infrared device. And I think, you know, what what is too soon to tell is there will be some permanent changes that are enacted from this. I think, you know, it's mm -hmm. easy to look back at um, September 11th and see just, just from a physical footprint how our um, airports have changed. And I think we will certainly see long-term permanent changes in our buildings regardless of whether we have to deal with this again, you know, if we magically have a vaccine and we don't have this, there will be permanent changes. I think some of it is going to be, um, you know, a change from mixed use to multi-use, which is it maybe having a little bit less stacked uses and a little bit more side-by-side -side uses. Um, there's a project in Seattle, the name escapes me, where it was senior housing on top of, you know, restaurants and bars. And we may not want to have old people near restaurants and bars all the time. So we may just rethink just from our own peace of mind, whether that's, um, you know, legislated or just how we feel going so, forward. So Stan, and, and I, I have a question for Dave, but before I, I just want to follow up on Rachel's point uh, to have Stan repeat something I've heard him say in other fora, which is just talking about managing office buildings in this environment and how horizontal buildings may come to be at an advantage again relative to vertical buildings? Yeah, we, we're in the process. Um, <clears throat> we just created a task force for downtown LA and we're working on the task force in New York as well for our properties there to try and determine exactly what our best practice is gonna be to open up the buildings when they start opening up. We, we don't exactly know yet how to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a process um, and it's twofold. One is the tenant. Um, who, how the tenants are going to adjust internally with their staff um, and how they're going to operate internally within their, their space and us as landlords, how we're going to be bring, bring people into the building. Um, if you saw the article in, over the weekend in the New York Times about the Four Seasons in New York, about how it converted into a hotel, uh, that they converted into a, um, a hotel for um, medical workers, um, if, you, if you read that and you realize that they were taking one person up at a time in an elevator, that is completely dysfunctional in an office building. So we're, we're trying to figure out what the appropriate um, spacing is going to be. And again, this is all predicated on the notion that there is no virus. Um, if there is, I mean, no, no vaccine. If there's a vaccine, then obviously all the, the whole conversation changes. But th this is going to be applicable across the board with all properties. We've got to figure out how to open up our multifamily properties in terms of getting people back into the gyms and what are we going to do from cleaning standpoint and is that going to increase our underlying costs um etc uh, so there's a lot of a lot of unknowns yet that we're still trying to work through so david a question about um from craig bornstein about um collections different between single tenant and multi-tenant properties um and he's commenting that in, in their portfolio they're seeing a pretty large difference I think it depends on the size of the tenant and the multi-tenant properties. So if you have a multi-tenant building that's, you know, 50,000 footer and you've got 225s, they're paying. If it's a, a bunch of 2,000 foot tenants or 5,000 foot tenants, um, for the most part, I think we're actually collecting most of the rents. I, the only ones that haven't paid or been troubles are like a deli or a gym that are kind of servicing the area. But other than that, um, even the multi-tenant, we've, we're collected almost all. I'm not gonna say we're 100%, but we're we're pretty close on all of our industrial multi-tenant or single tenant. So Stanley, you have any comment on that? Uh, no, same. It's the same thing. It's the small multi-tenant uh, that are that are the service tenants that are being um, more distressed. So so let me ask um, all of you about uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and again, I would think Rachel and Stanley, particularly given what you're doing, that this is something that you've been encountering. How do you think it's been going? What have been, so I guess about 260 billion of the 350 billion is now out. Who's getting that money? How is it going? What's the best way to get it, et cetera? So um, I'll, either one of you jump in. Can I be bad, Bob? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's been a real struggle. Um, I'm I'm pretty disappointed that the larger banks have have um, really dropped the ball on this. So if you're 
tenants are with smaller regional banks, they're much more successful in getting um, responses. And, um, you know, I just hope it comes in time. I'm sure there's somebody on this call who's a banker, and I will offend uh, them by saying this, but if you're a preferred customer of a bank, you're going to get money infinitely faster. I have uh, a lot of people that I know who have gotten uh, their, their documents already signed and they've been approved, um, but they're preferred customers. If you're not a preferred customer, it's going to be much more difficult to get through the system and to complete the paperwork and to be ultimately approved. Um, the, but the bigger issue about PPP, and I just want to caution all of us, is that there are a lot of people who are applying for PPP who shouldn't be applying for PPP. Um, and they all be, they better be uh, relevant, aware of the certifications that they're making and recognize that the government is going to, as, as even early this morning, I started receiving notices uh, from law firms indicating that the federal government is going to expand um, their, their enforcement of this because they suspect that there's a lot of people who are signing these things and being approved that shouldn't be getting the, the dollars. So there is a moral hazard associated with that as well. Yeah, can you be a little more specific about that? What sorts of things should you not have if you're going to go for one of these loans? Well, I'm gonna ask a question is, is why would somebody who's in the real estate business who's made a killing over the last five years be applying for PPP when they have the financial reserves to be able to, um, to, be able to handle the shortfall for a period of time? It's not that they're not paying, they can afford to pay their rent, so why are, they, why are they putting out there that they're gonna terminate half their people and then uh, keep them on payroll to get that loan? That's just my personal opinion. All right. Any, any thoughts from the other panelists on Stan's warning? I mean, I, I think if you have a preferred banker, you're probably not a nail salon or a hair, hair salon or, you know, this is who I'm talking about. So the, the institutional quality landlords are really holding the hands of small tenants to help them through this process because they don't know how to do this. So uh, from a best practices standpoint, um, at this point, most of the larger, um, you know, REITs and larger private institutional companies have a, you know, COVID thing on their website, go here, here's a little video. And they've pivoted a number of employees from doing whatever they used to do. And they're now tenant concierge um, services. And they are walking in some cases, line by line, walking through with those tenants and how to apply. But even with that support, it's, it's a struggle. Well, you know, Stan, you, you said something very revealing and, and this will be the subject I'm sure of academic papers. Of course, this virus is going to spawn zillions of academic papers. But if you're a preferred client, it probably means you don't need the program as much as a non-preferred client. So the rationing is going to the wrong people right now, if what you're saying proves to be true. Well, there are, there are retail owners out there that are being completely decimated. Um, as Rachel was suggesting, there's a lot of mom and pops that own shopping centers that are not collecting rent and they have debt that they have to pay off. And that debt, um, those property taxes and those debt payments still have to be made. Um, and to the extent that you're not making those payments, it's gonna, it's gonna be a problem. Now, do, are banks giving forbearance? And the answer is yes, forbearance is out there. And we've heard a number of cases and talking to our, um, a number of our lenders, we have heard that they're giving forbearance on a regular basis, uh, but that's only a temporary, um, a temporary alleviation of the problem. They'll give you two, three months of forbearance but you're still gonna to have to amortize that interest back in to the um, loan payment um, over time. So we don't know what this is gonna look like. And again, what Rachel was talking about is how quickly we get out of this and how rapidly the small mom and pops are gonna get there and be able to pay rent is, is open. So if, if you do the following exercise, imagine a loan that has six months of forbearance on it with a 4% coupon and um, you just have the, loan balance, the extra loan balance accrue at the end of the loan. So basically you don't change the payment. It comes due at the time that the loan is refinanced or the building is sold. What happens to the present value of that loan is it drops by in the neighborhood of 2%. And so one of the nice things about mortgages is you know what the cash flows are supposed to be, you know what discount rate you're supposed to use. And so you really can get analytically what the cost of that would be. 
and in light of the fact that the economy is going to shrink by something like 30% for a quarter, a 2% haircut doesn't seem all that bad to me. Well, when you're talking about, re but when you're talking about refinancing, you better start thinking about the fact that you've got a value diminution that may exist as a result of what is going on today. So and, what and is so the expect don't have values anymore, Stan? Huh? We don't have values anymore. We don't know who pays rent. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, I don't know what a cap rate is going to be when, when the tenants start paying rent, and I don't know what discount rates are going to be, and I don't know where the reset's going to be, but I can assure you that there is a reset. Yeah. So I, well, it, it gets to a couple of points uh, that I wanted to ask through. So first of all, I just, Rachel's comment about kicking the can down the road, I think that used to be a pejorative, but kicking the can is what saved commercial real estate in the global financial crisis. Extending to pretend actually worked pretty well. Um, and to Stanley's point, the recuperation of values in the aftermath of that was quite mm -hmm. rapid on the commercial side. Now, this is a very different kind of thing, so who knows, but at least there's some precedent there. Um, but I was go going to, on the whole issue of refinance, how much of, is this going to be an issue that loans are coming due and they're going to need to be refinanced in the next year or two and we aren't going to know what Nell TV is for a while. How much does this worry you? And I'll, again, leave that question open to any of our panelists. To me, it's an opportunity. <laughs> it's, an opportunity for, it's an opportunity for rescue capital. I mean, if, if, if everybody's sitting on the sidelines right now looking for opportunity. That's going to be the rescue capital opportunity. It's a great time to be in grocery retail. I mean, for our grocery clients that are you know, migrating to online to have this opportunity for people to use online click and collect and delivery grocery for the first time. Um, it's really outstanding because if you tried Instacart or Kroger pickup or in your area, most of you would be Ralph's. Uh, if you tried it three months ago and you didn't get just the right avocado, you were pretty upset. And now you're just thrilled to get anything. So, um, and now they're printing money because people need groceries and they'll be able to invest in their, macro and micro distribution for online, so. You know, I just want to say one thing. Um, a lot of people have been saying, talk to your lenders and get forbearance and all these issues. Um, and I would say you don't really want to do that. Not if you really want to be in this business in the long term and do deals in the future. And so I, I've never done it and I don't plan to do it. Um, so unless you own that single tenant building, it's your only asset and it's going to put you under, I don't recommend asking any uh, lender for forbearance because they remember it. They'll remember in two, three, four years when you come back, they won't want to make you the loan. So um, I don't think that's a strategy really for landlords unless you're really uh, desperate to, to try that. Well, I was going to say if your collections are 55% of normal and your debt cover is 1.25, you're sort of have your hand forced, right? If it's your, if it's your only property. But if you have multiple properties and other sources of income, I mean, I have a single tenant LA Fitness and they're not paying. And you know what? I paid the mortgage this month. I didn't say a word because you go back and you make the change or I asked for it. They actually called me and asked if I wanted to do something. And I said, no, because the reality is they'll remember that in two years and three years when you go to borrow the money again for something else. So it depends on your situation, obviously, but right. I, I would definitely say do not, if you can afford it, I wouldn't do it. I don't think we're at the end yet of, of retailers that haven't paid but still might pay. I think we still have some time. There have been retailers that have been shamed into paying, and we'll see what – a fitness retailer is probably not going to pay, but there are going to be some apparel retailers. I think um, there's some you know, pet and other retailers that will end up paying some. Well, Ulta wrote a letter saying they weren't going to pay anybody. Then they wrote a letter back saying, okay, now we're going to pay. Please waive your late fee. So – yeah. I think some of these are tenants are figuring it out. Yeah. One of the comments I didn't want to make about retail is, is that the, clearly the, the retailers that have been most impacted are not omni-channel directed. I mean, when you're omni-channel, you have, <clears throat> you have the ability to be able to work in an e-commerce environment. And the question is really going to be, we only focus on grocery anchor shopping centers. And what we're talking about internally is how do you deal with a mom and pop that is not omni-channel and will be impacted dramatically as a result of this. And we're trying to figure out how we create value going forward with bringing in other tenants that have different distribution methods to be able to provide for those uh, for the rent in those smaller spaces. So I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's something we're thinking about. So I do want to remind people that if you want to ask a question of the panel, 
please send an email to luskctr, all one word, L-U-S-K-C-T-R at USC dot edu. I have a question for Rachel. Yeah. Go so, ahead. Rachel, if I can ask, um, the foot traffic is down dramatically in retail, um, yet grocery sales are up significantly. So, mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out if grocery grocery traffic is down by 56 percent, um, which is just walk-in traffic. So, how is, is that being made up in e-commerce? Where so the, are you looking at the Placer AI data? Yeah, the Placer AI data. Yeah, I don't. Um, it supposedly covers the vast majority of these grocery retailers. Um, I mean, basket sizes is the simple answer. Um, so there's, it's truly only measuring a person walks into the door. So you end up with uh, Instacart orders where a single um, shopper is shopping multiple orders. You also have folks that are leaving their house once a week that are going and doing a huge shop where they used to go two, three, four times. Um, but yes, um, there's also a large increase in online. Uh, I don't know how to share my screen, but in, um, okay. in China, <laughs> in China in the first 10 days of February, there was a 215% increase in online grocery sales um, at JD.com. So I think we're probably seeing something similar to that. We don't yet have numbers on that though. So I think it's a combination of online and uh, larger basket sizes. So Rachel, I, I want to, follow up on a comment that Stan made, which was about the number of retailers who were on their way out anyway. Uh, what share would you put that at? Or do you think it's small? Do you think it's, well, I'll let you answer the question however you like, but given what Stan asked and you know the market better than the rest of us, what, what would you say, who do you, what share do you think don't come back? So, um you know, if it's just a mom and pop nail salon, hair salon, that, I mean, th those folks are going to really struggle. And, you know, I think we could see 20, 30% closures permanent. It's going to really depend on how their, um, their owner is treating them in terms of deferrals and abatements and, you know, walking them through the different services that are available to them and PPP and whatnot. Um, I think for the larger tenants, it's going to all depend on balance sheet. I mean, this is going to be the same thing. If you would have asked me, you know, who are the retailers that I should bet on, you know, where would I want to put, you know, invest my capital for, for my retailer? I mean, it's going to be the folks that have paid attention and invested well and saved up for a rainy day. And, um, you know, the, the, the blue chip names we all know. I'm, where I am a little bit concerned is, I think we're going to see a lot of closures in apparel. Um, it won't be a surprise that many of the department stores will close and not reopen. Where that is typically good for the off-price market, I think there is a scenario where if we have a flood of apparel in the next three to nine months, at first the off-price guys get to load up on inventory, and then at some point you end up with uh, just a glut. So it's possible that even if in a recessionary environment, if it's too bad, we may end up with it being negative for the off-price folks. So I do have some concerns there. Um, and then, you know, the category killers, like how many do we need, right? Yeah. You know, well, I, mean, the, I was going to just make a comment about the, the retailers. The, big, the balance sheet is really critical, as Rachel was talking about. Nordstrom's just came out with a $600 million bond offering, which was 8.75%. Um, which sort of shows you what the risk factor is there. Um, but that doesn't give them a lot of money to carry that for a very long period of time. Um, that's, I, from what I'm hearing, that's about a year's worth of, uh, of cash to be able to operate the, uh, the business. So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hazard out there that we all have to look at when we look at these firms and how rapidly we come out of this. You know, there will be a lot of malls that are no longer malls. I mean, I don't know how many years ago I would have thought, oh, well, we'll still need 500 malls. And now it's, we might need two or 300 malls, right? But, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity where you used to have, um, you know, the, the Sears and you, know, you got the Sears back and you were deciding between a Target and a Walmart and you decided on one and you figured, oh, well, maybe in three or four years, I'll get that Macy's box back. Well, now you get the Macy's box back. So there's still some opportunity. So what I, what I was thinking, though, is um, like the nail salons, yeah, the, the specific nail salons may go out of business, 
but there's still going to be a demand for people having their nails done when we come out of it. So it'll just be a different nail salon person who takes up that space. So it, it's hard for me to see how those sorts of services, you may have a lot of businesses go under, but the services still will come back and be there. Whereas other kinds of stuff that like dry goods, one could imagine that that space will never be used for that purpose again. Yeah. I mean, we're probably over restauranted. You know, I mean, we're over retail period, but I think there's just been so much of a reliance on, on restaurants to fill the gap where we lost other tenants over the last 10 years. And that's going to be, that's going to be really tough, but right, yeah, but, right now. It always mystified me anyway, because you know, the TIs on restaurants are very expensive and they go out of business on average every two and a half years. So I do have a number for you um, as of yesterday at 11 a.m. Arizona time. Uh, the, there were 61% of all U.S. retail stores were closed. That was 260,000 stores for um, 4,797 million square feet. And uh, this is what we have for retail sales growth and forecasts this is as of yesterday. I'll switch it back to the other one. Great. Um, That's a great slide. That is a great slide. Although four and five million square feet sounds small to me. Or is that meters? I no, mean, it's a square I think feet. It's million. Oh, billion. Square feet. oh it's, it's, uh, got it. It's billion square it's feet. Million got it. Got feet. it. Got it. Now that makes sense to me. All right. Yeah, I thought you said million before, and that's why I was kind of. Okay, it's great. It's a hard number, number to say out loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, a question from Patrick Sherardian. Um, stay at home owner took effect when we had 1,000 cases per day. Nothing has changed much since the beginning of the March. No vaccine, no meaningful therapies. I'm curious to see who in your panel thinks there will be, we will still be in this situation for the next 10 to 18 months. And what will do this do to price per square foot for retail and office in the long run, say two to three years from now? So that's a put you guys on the spot kind of question if ever I heard one. So that's the big debate that we're, we've been having uh, throughout the country over the last two weeks is what is the value of life versus what is the value of the economy. Um, and I'm going to suggest that the, the, the majority of people are going to start defaulting. And by the way, I'm not a Republican. Um, I think the people are going to start defaulting to figure out how to open this up faster in a way that get people out of their homes and, and being able to start the economy up. That's my projection. And they'll, they'll just be, there'll be, there'll be social standards that are going to be adjusted as we work towards a vaccine. I would say similarly, I think we will start to relax. And, and I think I mentioned this earlier. I think we'll start getting out of our homes in June. Um, I would be shocked if I went to an industry deal-making event before the fall of 2021. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be hard to have large events. And just for people to feel like they're comfortable going and for larger corporations to be willing to send their teams, especially now that folks are pretty comfortable with video. Um, you know, as someone in professional services, I will fly somewhere, but I've thought about, you know, when's the next time I'm going to fly to see people in New York? Well, none of them are in New York. When are they going to be back in New York? They're not going to be back in New York before September. So I'm not going to go anywhere. Where am I going to go? David. I mean, that, that raises a very interesting issue in terms of bringing people back to the office. Because one of the questions is going to be is, is that how are you going to deal with the anxiety of people who feel uncomfortable coming back to work and, and driving and taking transportation and being around other people? Um, the, it's a new area of law that we're going to have to think about because it's probably a disability that would fall under ADA that you'd have to give accommodation for. So we're, 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 back, we're dealing with a, a, a multiplicity of different issues as we talk about this. Well, along those lines, a new paper came out today by an MIT professor named Greg Harris, who has traced the expansion of COVID in New York City to the subway system. And he makes a very compelling case when you look at the density of turnstile use, it correlates incredibly strongly mm -hmm. with the density of the incidence of COVID in New York City. And of course, New York, without people being comfortable using the subway, is a completely different and perhaps non-competitive city. And so that to me is, is a pretty profound possibility that New York for a long time does not, is not a center of commerce because people are afraid to use the principal means of transportation for getting around it. 
Um, but I, I do want to hear, Dave, do you have any thoughts on where we're going in the next 10 to 18 months? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. That is as honest an answer as one could, I think, give at the moment. Um, a question from Odest Riley. Uh, this is to Dave. Uh, banks, he says, always have long memories when it comes to our, sh our shortcomings, but expect support from the market when they struggle. Um, if the majority of retail owners are mom and pop, should they be paying rent at the expense of their long-term sustainability? So was it a question for me for banks or for the retailers? Well, I think it's for the retailers, yeah. Well, uh, we need to pay our mortgage, so I need to collect the rent. I mean, we need to negotiate with the retailers to try to keep them in business, too. So it's a, it's a give and take. It's a give and take. So, and it, just a comment from Craig Bornstein. Oftentimes, telling your lender that you cannot pay triggers a default on your loan. Just, just the act of doing that. Um, do we have any more questions from the floor? I just want to, since we're talking about lenders and leases, I just want to remind everybody that if you are going, if you have debt, um, make sure that your debt covenants allow you to make changes to your leases without approval of the landlord. Otherwise, you may trigger a recourse carve out. You mean uh, without approval of the lender? Without approval of the lender. So you've got to be, you've got to read the, your loan docs very carefully in terms of what lease approvals that the lender has to sign off on. It's a footfall that could be very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Rachel? You I just add along the lines of what Dave was saying in dealing with your lender, um, something that the retailers need to be aware of is uh, sometimes they have their own covenants of the number, the percentage or number of leases that they have that cannot be in default. So if enough of them don't pay and enough landlords default them, they will be in trouble. So um, we'll just have to see how that plays out because there are a lot of landlords that are mm -hmm. unwilling to default those larger tenants. So let's turn to uh, uh, last words of wisdom from each of our three panelists. If there's anything you wanna say that you haven't gotten to say, so we'll start with Dave on this. Uh, well, I'll agree that I hopefully a lot of the retail landlords will stick together against some of these tenants and we can <laughs> push back against some of the bullying that going on from these credit tenants. Um, otherwise, it's kind of just to hunker down and try to collect what we can collect and pay our mortgages and uh, let's hope things improve. Rachel. I would say the same way that the lenders have long memories, I think owners will have long memories about uh, their tenants and how they acted now. And um, now we'll really be able to see where we have partners and where we don't. So, and Stanley. Uh, no, I just think I'd share the, the same comment though. I, our view is we have to work with our tenants as much as we possibly can. We don't want them to leave. We are going to work through and try and look at each individual situation carefully to make sure that we're making the right decisions. But we want to be proactive and in front of them. And as Rachel was talking about, help them navigate the process of getting PPP or the $10,000 special loan that is granted by the, the SBA, which is really a grant um, for a lot of these retailers. But we right. want to help them succeed and to be able to survive because we know this is very damaging to them and their personal lives. So with that, um, thank you, panel, very much for an enlightening and entertaining hour. And uh, stay healthy out there. Thanks, See everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.